Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and we shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Welcome to another presentation by Vigilate et Orate. This is Tyler Nethercott. Is Rome changing? Yes, I would say, and my response would be for the worse. An article showed up two days ago on the SSPX District of the United, State, United States website titled Bishop Fillet Discusses Prelature Rumors. In a sermon given in Poland last Friday, Bishop Bernard Fillet commented on the situation between the SSPX and Rome and the recent rumors. So what I'm going to do is, as I've done in the past, just highlight some key areas and share some thoughts. Firstly, the Pope would choose amongst the three names presented by the SSPX through its own elections. Just a quick question, sincere question, something that hasn't been clarified, and maybe this is still some of the details that would have to be ironed out, but is this just a one-time appointment or guarantee of a bishop from the ranks of the society? Or, you know, is it possible that that bishop could then, at some point, will die, and a different bishop would be appointed or no bishop at all. In other words, is there a perpetual lineage carried out through a process that protects the society or would it only be this one bishop? Just a question. This paragraph I'm going to get into some detail on. This first sentence that I've highlighted, a change happening inside the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. I would like to actually come back to that. So it's there. It's important. I'm going to come back to it. The SSPX could maintain its objection to religious liberty, ecumenism, and the new mass. Anybody notice anything missing from that sentence? The society has always protested collegiality, the doctrinal error found and suggested within Lumen Gentium. And it's notably missing here. Could be an oversight, could be an honest mistake. Obviously, they have it elsewhere on their website. I don't imagine they're trying to turn back on that point, but just thought I'd point out that that's missing. And finally, these outgrowths from the council are not considered as binding anymore or conditions to be recognized as Catholic. Bishop Fillet alludes here to the declarations of Archbishop Pozzo about the acceptance of Vatican II, which is not anymore, according to Pozzo, required to be Catholic. They have told us these questions are open questions. Well, not for any Catholic, they're not open questions. They are not open questions because if you believe that ecumenism, as we've seen it portrayed at Assisi and countless other places, is okay and is permissible for Catholics, that's not true. It is a violation of the First Commandment. It is a violation of the past teachings of the popes. And so is religious liberty a violation of the doctrine of the church and the primacy of the church and its rights in society and the rights of Almighty God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And collegiality is an erroneous doctrine which suggests that the College of Cardinals are equal to or greater than the Pope himself, which is an error and false and, and is, is heretical, in fact. So, my question is, when did the mindset of the Society of St. Pius X shift from telling Rome, you are in error, you are in effectively in schism with eter eternal Rome, you are on the path to, or in fact, apostate, to then praising or rejoicing, rather, in the fact that Rome is now calling the Society Catholic if the Society chooses to disagree on those three points and principles of the Council, as well as the Novus Ordo Missae. It seems that the society of old would have told Rome, you you are not Catholic, you, do, you deceive yourselves, you are leading people astray, Vatican II must go, it needs to be thrown in the garbage can, and we need to restore the church and get back to the traditions of the church. Today, the response merely seems to be, we are happy to be recognized as Catholics, even in spite of the fact that we do not agree with these points, and that's good enough. Or that's 
that's a good starting point, and we're willing to to talk from there. Uh, I think a position of more doctrinal rigidity is uh, prudent, if I can use that word. So back to this original point, a change is happening inside the congregation for the doctrine of faith. Jumping down to the bottom, Cardinal Muller asking the SSPX to join his fight against the modernists. Now, Cardinal Muller, for those of you who don't know, is the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And Cardinal Muller wrote a book called De Messa, The Mass. So if I go back, Cardinal Muller is asking the SSPX to join his fight against the modernists. So Bishop Fillet believes Cardinal Muller is fighting modernism and fighting the modernists. This, what I'm about to reveal in the next few slides, is offensive to pious ears. Um, this is from De Messa. In reality, body and blood of Christ does not signify the physical parts of the man Jesus during his life or in his glorified body. Body and blood here signifies specifically the presence of Christ in the symbolism of bread and wine. So here we're seeing something from Muller that was also employed by Ratzinger, which is to constantly be referring to the man of Jesus Christ, which in and of itself makes a suggestion that Christ's humanity could be separated from Christ's uh, divinity, which in fact we know Christ was fully human, fully divine, at the same time, simultaneously, never separately, in the sense of his incarnation, and to suggest otherwise is to review all of the early church heresies about our Lord's nature. Body and blood here signifies specifically the presence of Christ in the symbolism of bread and wine. Well, the church has already defined, and the Council of Trent defined, what our Lord's presence is, truly, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, under the appearance of bread and wine. Not in a symbolism, but under the appearance, visibly to our senses, of bread and wine, while truly and literally being the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. We now have communion with Jesus Christ through the eating and drinking of the bread and wine. Just as in an interpersonal relationship, a letter can show the friendship between persons and illustrate the affection of the sender for the recipient. I don't even know how that's relevant. This reading just sounds like liberal modernist uh, garbage. It's vague. It's ambiguous. The essence of the bread and the wine, therefore, must be defined in an anthropological way. Anthropological. What does anthropological mean? It means relating to the study of humankind. Pope St. Pius X in his famous encyclical against the modernists, which obliterated and crushed the modernists in the early 20th century. From these two principles, the modernists deduced two laws, which then united with the third, which they have already gotten from agnosticism, constitute the foundation of historical criticism. We will take an illustration from the person of Christ, in the person of Christ, they say, science and history encounter nothing that is not human. And later, modernists believe the representations of the divine are merely symbolical. Back up. Symbolism, anthropological, human, the man of Jesus Christ, the man Jesus during his life. Put it together. This is, this is modernist. This is absolutely modernist, and I'll prove it further, and I'll keep going. This is from a text or a document that Cardinal Muller put together some years back about the Protestants. We determine our relationship to each other no longer with regard to the differences that actually exist in the doctrine, life, and constitution of the Church, but rather on the common foundation upon which we stand that, in and of itself, is condemned. I failed to include it in this presentation. I forgot. But that is condemned both by, I believe, it's Pius XII in Humani Generis and Pius XI in Mortalium Animos, where they basically say 
these modernists, these liberals, these uh, theosophists seek to to under this kind of form of Arian Arianism to find a common foundation and basically put aside all of our differences, which in in essence is Freemasonry. Baptism is a fundamental sign that we are sacramentally united in Christ and that presents us as one visible church before the world. Cardinal Muller, whosoever offends one point offends all. That's the sacred scripture. We are not united. We are divided. We are divided by what separates us, by key doctrines and dogmas. We are not one church, one visible church before the world. That's heresy. Thus, we as Catholic and Protestant Christians are already united, even in what we call the visible church. Strictly speaking, these are not several churches, one besides the other, but rather these are separations and divisions within the one people and one house of God. I'm kind of speechless. We're not one with the Protestants. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. They do not. They don't believe in apostolic succession. They don't believe in the doctrines of the Catholic faith. They're not one. They're disjointed all with each other because of all their disagreements. They believe in sola fide, sola scriptura. They don't believe in the true presence of our Lord Jesus. I don't have to keep going on. This isn't about Protestants and Catholics. The point is, Cardinal Muller is not a Catholic. He's not. He's 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 preaching doctrines that are condemned, highly condemned. This is his response about the dubia. The Pope is basically forced to answer with a yes or no. I don't like that. So the four cardinals put out their dubia, asked the Pope with five questions to clarify Amoris Laetitia, and asked the Pope yes or no very clearly, which is a very effective and necessary uh, means of getting to the crux of a matter and, and, and to basically... Uh, put a modernist in a corner and on the spot to answer yes or no to questions. And Cardinal Muller says, well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like the yes or no. I don't like that. I think the Pope should be able to live in ambiguity. So Bishop Pillay is suggesting that we're going to join forces with the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith headed by Cardinal Muller to fight modernism. Well, they accuse our Lord of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. And our Lord responded, basically, how would I do that? How, how does that even make any sense? Well, how are we going to cast the demons, the modernists, out of Rome with the help of modernists? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Rome is no longer one. It is divided. And in such a way that some see things have gone too far and they say you have to do something you have to resist Rome is not now divided Rome has been divided since Vatican II there were three groups there were the traditionals, traditional traditionalists the quote unquote conservatives or neo-conservatives neo-orthodox and the heterodox liberals and they were all split and they've been split since then you had Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bacci and Archbishop Lefebvre and, and others representing the true faith. You had Ratzinger and Botiwa and uh, you know a few other people representing the, the so-called neoconservatives. And you had the Karl Rahners and the Hans Kungs and the von Balthazars and, and the Sunans who were the liberals in trying to introduce all kinds of crazy liberal uh, doctrines into the church we've been divided Rome has been divided this isn't something new and to say that well now people are kind of waking up maybe maybe Francis is pushing things too far but is that a good thing if Francis is really causing the modernists even to say whoa 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 slow down what are we doing talking to Francis and acting like he's our friend and wants to help us and who are these uh you know, people, I guess I'll get into this. Bishop Fillet mentions also the support and the letters he receives from the bishops. As for the bishops, there are others who speak, who resist, who are not alone. According to Bishop Fillet, a whole work of renewal of the church has begun. Um, 
with whom? Who? Who are these cardinals and bishops who are in such great support of the society? And what are they supporting? Are they supporting the Latin Mass? Are they supporting somebody standing up and saying no to, you know, the, 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 the rejection of the indissolubility of marriage by Amoris Laetitia? What are they saying no to? So we get these vague kind of suggestions like, hey, we have friends in Rome and all over the world who, who, who support us and encourage us and want us back in the church so that we can help fight together. Well, who are these people? If he's referring to, to, to these figures like Cardinal Burke and Bishop Schneider, those men are liberals. They belong to that neoconservative camp, which is comprised of liberals and liberal ideals, ecumenism, religious liberty, collegiality, the new mass. They believe in all of those things. Bishop Schneider is a huge proponent of interreligious dialogue, false ecumenism. And they believe and have fallen for the same uh, lie which Benedict promoted, this hermeneutic of continuity, so-called, which is which is a fallacy. But they believe it. They believe that John Paul II was St. John Paul II the Great. They believe that. So who are these people that are supporting? If there are truly men out there, ecclesial figures, Episcopal representatives, who completely agree with what the society is doing and always has done, then they need to stand up. They need to stop being cowards. They need to rise up and defend the truth and join their voice to the voices of the society and of, of the Archbishop Lef, uh, of Archbishop Lefebvre, and they need to defend the truth. But otherwise, I don't know how we can sit and believe that there's supposedly all these hidden allies. And if we get this deal with Rome, are they just going to spring forward and say, here we are now, ready to help you because you're finally back in a formal canonical structure? It just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So Bishop Fillet unfortunately tells us that he's ready to join forces with Cardinal Muller to fight the modernists and that we have many allies in Rome. And at the same time, Bishop Fillet is not blind. He does not mean that we go forward. We must go with great prudence and also secure our future to be able to prevent any possibility of trap. Therefore, we are not running in this situation. So here he says we have to pre prevent any possibility of a trap. But just a few months ago, he said it's not even possible that it could be a trap. So I'm going to try to capture this audio. Hopefully this works. So we have to remain prudent there. But in a sense, you cannot imagine anything better than what is offered there. And such a thing that you cannot think that's a trap. It's not a trap. And if somebody is offering something like that, it can be only because he wants good to us. He wants the good of tradition, he wants the tradition to, to say, spread in the church. It's impossible to think that such a thing could be invented by enemies. The enemies have many other ways to crush us down, but not that. Does anyone believe that? I mean, I, I honestly, I first read the text of this, and I had a hard time believing that Bishop Fillet would actually say that, because I, there's no two ways about it. That just seems so naive. Francis has done absolutely nothing to show that he favors tradition, and yet Bishop Fillet says it's clear he wants the spread of tradition in the church. It's impossible that this is a trap. Impossible. The enemies have many other ways to deceive us, not this one. Absolutely impossible. I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. You know, St. Paul... St. Paul wrote to the Galatians, O senseless Galatians, who hath bewitched you? 
And he goes on to talk about how the first time he visited them and they, and they had their conversion and they were baptized, that they would have been willing to die for him, to die for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he leaves for a time and he comes back and they're slipping back into their old ways and they're falling for the, for the lies and deceptions of the Jews about the need to adhere to the Mosaic law and to be circumcised. And he says, who hath bewitched you? Who hath bewitched our beloved bishop, our beloved society, into thinking that Francis is a friend, that Cardinal Muller, who's a modernist, is a friend, that, that Cardinal Burke and, and Bishop Schneider, who are liberals, are friends? Who, 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 what's happened? This isn't even how they spoke a few years ago. A few years ago, Bishop Follet stood at a podium like this and said, we have in Francis a genuine modernist. And now three, four years later, he, he's saying he's our friend. He wants the good of tradition, the good of society. He, he wants to help us. This is madness. Madness. Sometimes liberalism stalks along in the careless trappings of an easy-going good nature or a simplicity of character which invites our affection and allays our suspicion, but all the greater the danger when it appears least possible. Sound like anyone? Francis, maybe? They erect into dogma what is called the principle of toleration. The differences of belief are, after all, they complacently argue due to differences of temperament, education, etc. They show themselves with some appearance of probity and sound doctrine. They thus deceive the indiscreet friends of conciliation and seduce honest people who otherwise have strenuously combated a declared error. This book had the highest praise of Rome in the late 19th century. I believe it was Pope Leo XIII who gave his full endorsement of this book and its condemnation of all of the liberal errors. It's basically like Pope St. Pius X's Pascendi, but on liberalism, and, and written by a priest, not by a pope, but it had the support of the pope. They show themselves with some appearance of sound doctrine, and thus they deceive indiscreet friends and seduce honest people who otherwise have strenuously combated a declared error. Society of St. Pius X strenuously has combated more than one error for the last 50 years. And they're honest people. I think they're honest, sincere, and yet maybe indiscreet. And being seduced. O senseless Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Of course, Bishop Fillet mentions also the paradoxical interest Pope Francis has for the SSPX. A pope who does not care for doctrine, who looks at the people, and who has known us in Argentina. And he appreciated our work in Argentina. And that's why he sees us with a good disposition, while in the same time he is against conservatism. This is like a contradiction. But I have been able to verify several times that he really does things personally for us. If Francis has seen anything that he likes of the Society of St. Pius X, it would be corporal works of mercy, caring for the poor, all these things which he professes to supposedly care about. And I'll even give him the benefit of the doubt to say maybe he does. He has no conception for spiritual works of mercy or for doctrine. And Bishop Fillet says it. He does not care for doctrine. He looks at the people. Well, you, that's like separating Christ's mercy from Christ's justice, which Francis tries to do, but is an impossibility. It's like trying to separate Christ's divinity from his humanity, an impossibility. It just doesn't... I can't be the only one who thinks that something seems wrong here, that something shifted. The Catholic simply tainted with liberalism is generally a good man and sincerely pious. His strong point is charity. He is charity itself. To treat as a liar the man who propagates false ideas is, in the eyes of this singular theologian, of this Catholic 
tainted with liberalism, is to sin against the Holy Spirit. To him the falsifier, Francis, is simply misguided. It is not the poor fellow's fault. He has a simple soul and has been misled. We ought neither to resist nor to combat him. We must strive to attract him by soft words and pretty compliments. How the devil must chuckle over the mushy charity held out as a bait to abet his own cause. An article showed up on the Society of St. Pius X's website in the last couple of days by Father Glaze, uh, basically saying, Francis is spreading heresy but is not a heretic. I read through it a couple of times. I've tried to view it objectively. And maybe Father Glaze has a an objective juridical point, perhaps. I think there's plenty of other people arguing that Francis has written explicit heresy and has said things that are explicitly heretical. But let's just think practically. Practically. Not juridically. Practically. How can someone who spreads heresy not be a heretic? If you sow cockle amongst the wheat, you're an enemy. You can't sow cockle and not be an enemy and not be a sower of cockle. If you sow seeds into the earth, you are a sower of seeds. You're a farmer. Uh, I believe it was Pope St. Pius X. who basically spoke about practical atheists and actual atheists and those whose deeds uh, prove by their deeds that they're atheists because they don't live in a way that, like they believe in Christ or in anything. Same with Leo the Thirteenth when he wrote in, uh, uh, I think it maybe was uh, Custodia di Quella Fede, the, the, one of his encyclicals on Freemasonry, to beware not only of those who openly declare themselves to be Masons, but all those, also those who wear a hidden mask and who espouse their doctrines and their beliefs and promote their tenets. And so he says basically they're, they're, they're suspicious of being uh, uh, practical Masons as well. So Francis is a practical heretic. If he's spreading heresy, he is a practical heretic. And yet we see these defense, almost it's coming across as a defense. Now it's not, it's not like they're praising Francis. Uh, it's not like Father Glaze is praising Francis. But there's some manner of justification going on of Francis and specifically of conversation and dialogue with him in pursuit of a canonical recognition. It's really, really notable that the resistance to these errors of Rome and this combat or spirit of combat to conciliar Rome has decreased. Most people don't even hear anything about it from their priests anymore. The, the, the spirit of combat is being taken away in favor of something uh, more flowery, like a consistent... A sermon about charity or duty of state or you know whatever all good things all all good things but it's the duty of every catholic and especially of every priest and every bishop to equally denounce error and to warn the faith the faithful and to warn the flocks and to tell them and enliven them to keep up the combat as it is their duty to, to edify them uh by by various treatises on charity, on the, on the theological virtues, and, and the like. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, both are abominable before God. It seems today that we're seeing those who were most vocal about Rome and about the errors being condemned. The recent article, which I covered, about satire... Uh, and the use of satire and anonymous bloggers who, who I believe are genuinely trying to help 
restore the church and denounce error and defend truth are being persecuted while Francis and Muller and these others are being held up as well they're being justified they're wicked people being justified Modernists are more mischievous, the less conspicuously they appear, nor indeed will he err in accounting them the most pernicious of all the adversaries of the church. For as we have said, they put their designs for her ruin into operation, not from without, but from within. Hence the danger is present almost in the very veins of the church. None is more skillful, none more astute than they. In the employment of a thousand noxious arts, for they double the parts of rationalists and Catholic, and this so craftily that they easily lead the unwary into error. Pope St. Pius X and Pascendi Dominici Gregis. This is so important. They're cunning. The modernists are cunning. I think there probably are stupid ones amongst them, but I don't know how many of the stupid ones make it to the rank of bishop or cardinal or pope. Francis is no idiot. He's their guy. He's the one they wanted. They lobbied for him. They jockeyed for him. The St. Gallen Mafia arranged his election, if it can even be called that. He's not an idiot. And for some reason, some senseless Galatians have been be bewitched into thinking that he is. That he's some naive... Uh, humanitarian-minded, friend of the poor, pseudo-Franciscan, who doesn't like doctrine but means well. That's the way that he's being painted today by the Society of St. Pius X. And I don't, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. I don't understand what's happened. But this is clear. He is a modernist. Bishop Flake called him as much a few years ago. And rightly so. And today it's like, well, how, this is not a trap. He wants, you know, we see these confusing contradictions. They're contradictions because he's two-faced, because he speaks out of both sides of his mouth to try to achieve his designs, which seem by all indications to be to destroy the church. He's almost said as much. He said he will split the church. He said he will reform the church, and he will not stop. It requires from us that we protect the faithful from evil and error. Okay, bingo. Pause. I'm not even going to keep reading. That's so important. Here, Pope St. Pius X says it outright. We must protect the faithful from evil and error. That means preaching it from the pulpit. That means warning people about errors. That means denouncing them. It's not enough and it's not sufficient to only preach good. Especially so when evil and error are presented in dynamic language, which concealing vague notions and ambiguous expressions with emotional and high-sounding words is likely to set ablaze the hearts of men in pursuit of ideals which, whilst attractive, are nonetheless nefarious. Such were not so long ago the doctrines of the so-called philosophers of the 18th century, the doctrines of the revolution and of liberalism, which have been so often condemned under the glowing appearance of generosity. Again, Pope St. Pius X, our apostolic mandate. I've said enough, and I'll close, only by reiterating the words of the Archbishop himself, who gave us such clear instruction for how we ought to continue out his apostolate in the effort of defending the tradition and of carrying the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Archbishop said this in an interview shortly after the consecrations of 1988. We don't agree. It is a dialogue of death. I can't speak much of the future. Mine is behind me. But if I live a little while, supposing that Rome calls for a renewed dialogue, then I will put conditions. I shall not accept being in the position where I was put during the dialogue no more. I will place the discussion at the doctrinal level. Do you agree with the great encyclicals of all the popes who preceded you? Do you agree with Quanta Cura of Pius IX, of Immortali Dei and Libertas of Leo XIII, 
Pascend egregious of Pius X, quas primus of Pius XI, humani generis of Pius XII. Are you in full communion with these popes and their teachings? Do you still accept the entire anti-modernist oath? Are you in favor of the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you do not accept the doctrine of your predecessors, it is useless to talk. As long as you do not accept the correction of the council, in consideration of the doctrine of these popes, your predecessors, no dialogue is possible. It is useless. Close the book. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, 1988. My dear friends, my dear brethren, has Rome changed? Yes, indeed, Rome has changed. Rome has gotten worse. Rome continues its plummet into the pit, pulling with it hundreds of thousands of souls every year. When will somebody of courage stand up, echo the voice of the Archbishop and of St. John the Baptist himself and all the other great saints and martyrs who have died defending the faith and try to save some of these poor souls by denouncing Francis publicly all of his errors and letting God, Almighty God, who controls all things, and our Blessed Mother in Heaven, who intercedes for us and on our behalf and will do so before a time of peace, let them worry about the rest.